video, this video is basically, we're going to talk about the pond in this video. And it's going to be, this video is in particular is for the CACs, which are Certified Aquascape Contractors. These guys uh, build and install and maintain uh, an ecosystem style pond uh, all across North America, actually globally. I know a couple of the guys in other countries that are putting in the uh, ecosystem type pond from Aquascape. And this is uh, preparatory to a seminar that I'll be giving in uh, late February. And so what I wanted to do in this hour, and it may or may not even take the full hour, is just give you the nuts and bolts of water quality. And I'm not going to recite the nitrogen cycle because probably quite a few of you already know that. And the way I'm going to get into this subject is I'm going to pretend that somebody like Chris Tallarico or, uh, I don't know, BJ Linger or Brian Speed or something like that is sitting in the passenger seat right next to me. And we're driving somewhere, and I'm pre pretending – I am going to pretend that I'm trying to catch them up on water quality before we arrive at our destination. If I jump around um, – or uh, am not making sense, then if you went to the website coivet.com, K-O-I-V-E-T.com, you could find uh, more succinct articles on some of the things I'm talking about. So uh, I'm not going to apologize for possibly being a little bit, um, a little bit all over the place. So um, first, I want to say how much I admire the CACs because there are a lot of you – You've taken the time to get really good at what you do. You've taken the time to qualify, um, and you uh, believe in your references. You believe in your product, and I feel like if I recommended somebody to you that you would be able to take better than average care of that person that I sent to you for an ecosystem pond. Uh, that said, I'd like to move on into uh, basics of water quality, and so, Chris, thanks for coming along. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, so let, let's just go over water quality real fast. Um, it Basically, it has to do with uh, the nitrogen cycle, which I mentioned earlier. And everything in the nitrogen cycle is based on uh, kind of like two things. One of them is beneficial bacteria, and the other is a place for that beneficial bacteria to live. And uh, beneficial bacteria is an interesting subject because we thought at one time that it was all one kind of bacteria. They call them autotrophs, um, which are bacteria that require a specific chemical to live. And we thought there was one autotrophic bacteria, and that was, uh, let's see, nitrosomonas was the ammonia-reducing bacteria. That It was just one kind of bacteria that just used ammonia. And then there was another one called nitrobacter that reduced uh, nitrite into nitrate. And so we thought there were like two bacteria involved using these two compounds. Uh, more uh, research down the road re revealed that there were actually a bunch of different kinds of bacteria that do that and uh, that they're uh, not exactly exclusive as far as the nitrogen source. And, and it's just a, it's a marvelous ecosystem out there. Um, but what I'm kind of leading into is that, yes, while we have these beneficial bacteria, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, uh, where they live is kind of a – I'll just call it a slime layer, although it's not really slimy, but there's a, like a layer, and it's called a biofilm. And this biofilm is, um, is just a film that covers everything in the system uh, that's underwater, and in that biofilm is where the beneficial bacteria live. And um, so there's kind of a couple of interesting things about the biofilm. Um, First, the biofilm is crucially important, and that matters when it comes to pond cleanouts. If you clean out the pond too hard, you're really going to wreck a lot of the biofilm. The biofilm is a good thing. Um, rotting food, uh, the occasional dead fish, rotting leaves, stuff like that, not so much. Um, but the biofilm itself, uh, that natural coating on rocks and stuff, is uh, is a good thing. And uh, the, the biofilm is, is going to have a lot of bearing on what we talk about this weekend because it, um, it's, a, it's a buffer against – it's an organic buffer against some of the things that you might do to the pond, and it's something that should be spared in a clean-out. So kind of there's that. Um, 
just in a nutshell overview of the nitrogen cycle that gives you the kind of water quality that you want, when the fish um, produce wastes, solid and liquid wastes, uh, that's ammonia, and then there's a bacteria or bacteria type in the biofilm that reduces the ammonia into another compound. That starts this thing called the cycle. And um, so the uh, ammonia is uh, reduced into nitrite. And nitrite is toxic to fish. Not, um, you know, not like flip the fish over immediately toxic. It has to build up into the system and it moves inside the fish and it complexes with the red cells. And when the fish has screwed up red blood cells, then it, it's uh, pretty much effed. And uh, then they'll start dying uh, in dribbles and drabs. And then as nitrites get more and more, um, they die harder and harder. Um, there's an easy test for it. There's a, it's a dipstick kind of test. You just put the strip in the water, and uh, it'll tell you if you have a nitrite problem or not. And uh, there's a specific on that, actually, I'd like to pick up right here, and that is it'll tell you, remember what I said, it'll tell you if you have a nitrite problem or not. And the, the significance of that statement is where all of these pundits get so twisted up about the accuracy of a test like that. OK, uh, here's the thing. If you have nitrites, registrable nitrites, especially registrable on a dipstick, you've got a problem and you need to act on that. Uh, I don't understand why people get so bent if you're measuring 0.1 or 0.2, which is a 100 percent difference in the level of nitrite. They get so bent, you know, oh, no, you're, you're getting a 0.1 when you're actually supposed to have a 0.2. I'm sitting there going, it doesn't matter. If you have a 0.1 or a 0.2, you need to low-level salt, you need to kind of back off on the feeding a little bit. You need to find out what's wrong with the biofilm, what's wrong with the beneficial bacteria that's allowing that nitrite to build up. You, you have a job to do, regardless of what the nitrite level is. I suppose, okay, if you have a 0.5 nitrite, uh, you maybe even, I don't know, you need to do a 90% water change or some craziness like that. But just having nitrites, it doesn't really matter whether your test is accurate to the tenths. Um, so uh, the ammonia is broken down by a bacteria into nitrite, and then there's another beneficial bacterial colony that breaks the nitrites quickly down into nitrates. And then uh, once the nitrates are produced, the, uh, the final use of nitrates is basically by plant material. Nitrates plus phosphates plus a little bit of iron plus the sun, and any plant you have is going to grow like a weed. Uh, and that plants can include single cell or unicellular algae. And therefore, a lot of times when the cycle is complete, you'll get a green water bloom. Plus or minus your plants are going to do great. And uh, then there's that dynamic between algae and live plants. And that is that live plants compete with the algae for that nitrate. So sometimes a big part of the cure for green water is actually live plants, which is nice because the ecosystem pond actually has a ton of live plants in it, usually. And, uh, well, that brings me to another point, and that is that uh, everybody knows who keeps koi. We all know that you can't keep koi with live plants because they're going to eat the live plants. So, you know, perish the thought, right? So all those ponds out there that you manage – that have koi with the live plants is just a figment of your imagination. You're obviously high. Not really. It turns out if you keep the koi fed and the plant material is relatively abundant and you protect the root systems of plants from too much rooting, and that's really just about as simple as using egg rock in the pots that you have your lilies in or if you put the lilies directly into some sort of substrate in the pond, uh, and you put egg rock around the base, and the, all but the largest koi can root in that. Uh, protect the roots and have plenty of plants. There's a kind of an inundation thing where there's just too many plants for any one of them to be killed. And I've had perfectly good luck with that. Except one time I went out of town for like four days, and nobody fed the fish, and so they picked the lilies clean of leaves. Um, but generally speaking, Plants and koi do fine, and you've got your plants in there as your nitrate reducer, and uh, all is well. So there's the nitrogen cycle. It's a beneficial bacteria living in the biofilm, reducing ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Ta-da! Um, and so that's 
basically the nitrogen basis of water quality, and so you want to be nice to your biofilm. So that's going to come into play when we talk in the uh, hour that I have the in the upcoming weekend uh, when I talk about uh, the perfect cleanouts. That's going to have fish health in it, but it's also going to have a discussion about biofilm in the ecosystem. Uh, moving on in water quality, there is another parameter that matters, and it's called pH, and that is a measurement of the free and uh, of the free hydroxyl ions in the system, and uh, it's quantified in the Michalis-Menten equation, and it's measured on a, a scale of uh, well, at least a scale of the livable by fish between about 5.5 up to 8.5. It can go higher and it can go lower and fish can survive that. It just can't go much higher or much lower rapidly. If the pH crashes out, goes from say 7 to 5 uh, or from a chronic level of say 8, which is fine, and drops to 6, Overnight, that's called a pH crash, and that can whack a lot of fish. It'll look like a dissolved oxygen issue. It'll look like you something got in the pond that killed all the fish. Um, and yet, with a water test strip, you dip that in there, and you'll find that the pH has crashed, and it was no big deal. I mean, other than losing all the fish, it was nothing that you couldn't fix with a box of baking soda and then some crushed oyster shell later to support the pH from crashing like that. Now, a lot of you guys are never going to deal with that because the ecosystem pond is usually built on some sort of aggregate. Uh, there's usually some sort of gravel uh, or rocks built into the uh, ecoscape, um, and th those are going to be slowly dissolving and providing you with some support for the pH. So this may or may not be something you guys have ever encountered in uh, in nature, so um, in, in the systems that you maintain. So there's, a, there's the pH, which can crash. Um, and I told you that, it, uh, and I was kidding about even understanding the Michalis-Menten equation. I don't even understand it. I just throw it out there to say that pH is kind of complex, and it's a measurement of the free hydroxyl ions and all that other crap. But it's basically on a scale, uh, a preferable scale of 6 to 8. And we like around seven. That's called neutral. And you can keep it there with uh, stuff like crushed oyster shell or, as I mentioned, sometimes your ponds just stay there because you're using aggregates that actually slowly dissolve things like limestone. And uh, other times not. So it might be something you want to measure for a while or have the client measure in their ecosystem pond for a while until you figure out whether or not it's naturally supported or not. What about this pH crash thing? Um, so you're saying that if we test for it, we'll uh, be able to detect it once it happens, but what could we test that would prevent it from happening in the first place? And the answer to that is total alkalinity. And there are lots of tests out there for total alkalinity. Um, I will double check to see if the 6-in-1 has that, and if it does, I will put that in the resources under this video. But uh, total alkalinity is really the backbone of pH. It is a measurement of the dissolved carbonates in a system. Carbonates give and take those hydrogen ions. So it's kind of like a reserve backing up the pH. So if your pH is 7 and it wants to move up or down, it has to do that in spite of carbonates. So when it tries to move in a downward direction, the carbonates or those rocks I was talking about, they start to dissolve and give up a lot of the uh, carbonates, and that binds the pH back at 7. Or if the pH tries to go up a lot, it's hard to do because the uh, limestone or whatever you're using to support the carbonates starts to kind of dissolve and release hydrogen ions and keep the pH down around 7. It kind of pegs the pH wherever you've got it. Um, and then the... Uh, um, so the carbonates back that up. And so you might say, okay, so all right, tell me more about that. I mean, like, what do I want? High carbonates, low carbonates, what? To back up the pH, you're going to want high carbonates. Not crazy high. You don't need 180. You don't even need 100. Uh, you can have that. That's fine. But what you're looking for, uh, anything over 30, anything under 30 in carbonates or total alkalinity, anything under 30 is kind of slippery slope as far as pH crash is concerned. 
And in Georgia, where your water's pretty soft most of the time, the total alkalinity is less than 30. Well, then out in Reno, Nevada, for example, where all the water comes from rain on limestone, the total alkalinity could be 180, which is okay uh, for the most part. And there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about that. But with a total alkalinity of 180, pH crash can't happen. It's not. This would be complete mystery to somebody out there because they've never even witnessed pH crash before because it just doesn't happen with a total alkalinity of 100, So, uh, let alone 180. So it might be worth knowing what the prevailing total alkalinity in your tap water uh, and the pond is. And uh, again, it's an easy test, just a dip, stip, dip strip, and uh, then that'll give you an idea how far from pH crash you are. So to recap, pH is a measurement between 6 and 8. We like it around 7. What keeps the pH from dropping suddenly is carbonates. That's a measurement of total alkalinity. Carbonates come from dissolving rocks or chemicals that you put in the water, and uh, supported with high total alkalinity, you don't have to worry about pH crash. There is so much more to know about pH. If you are the studious type and you want to go to coivet.com or to my YouTube channel or whatever, you can um, find other information about pH. Uh, and, of course, the book has a crap ton about pH as well. Uh, if you're just bored or having trouble sleeping, you can check that out. So uh, briefly on dissolved oxygen, most of, this is one of the things I really like about aquascape or ecosystem ponds, and that is that oxygen levels are usually fine. And the reason for that is because there's just about always a waterfall. And noisy water and waterfalls are always a great way to get the uh, dissolved oxygen level up. Now, okay, let's say that you have a pond that is a quarter of an acre. Uh, the owner of Aquascape, Greg Whitstock, has a pond as big as that. Uh, because he's got a waterfall or three, does that mean his pond is, is uh, adequately oxygenated? And the answer is yes and no. If the fish started, for some reasons, to run into a dissolved oxygen issue, they could always go to where the waterfalls are. Are they smart enough to do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the where the waterfalls are, almost against any odds, where those waterfalls are in that vicinity is going to be adequately oxygenated water. Um, and my point being on the noisy pond thing, if you heard what I said before, is that um, where you hear water movement, splashing, agitation, is surface disruption. And that's the only place dissolved oxygen mixes with water. It takes atmospheric pressure to push air into water so these air bubblers, for example, with the bubbles coming up off this air stone or whatever, the amount of oxygen that they mix with water at the bubular level, I just made up a word there, bubular, is very uh, almost insignificant. Uh, where the air column, uh, the bubbles push water to the surface, and you see that agitation, is where a lot of water meets the atmosphere and dissolved oxygen uh, permeates into the water, and carbon dioxide and other gases can be blown off. Um, so air stones, those work. Waterfalls, especially because you're just moving that water down through a thin phase, uh, which can cause rapid cooling and rapid heating. That's a thing called supercooling in wintertime, and that's not being discussed in this video, uh, but elsewhere. Um, but degassing and oxygenation occur very, very well in, in waterfalls. And so most of the time, dissolved oxygen isn't an issue in an aquascape installation uh, with a waterfall. And then you might say, oh, okay, well, I don't have to worry about that, so I'll see you. Um, what happens sometimes is, let's say it's really warm and warm water carries less oxygen. It does. It carries a lot less oxygen, which sucks because that's at a time of year when the fish's metabolism is at its highest. So the oxygen level or oxygen requirement of the water or the fish is, is at its highest when the water carries the least amount of oxygen. Um, Saturation is hard to achieve. Let's just say that also you've got green water. Um, green water is uh, algae. And it's a good thing during the day because algae produces oxygen during the day, a lot of it. Sometimes so much that it can actually hurt the fish, but that's rare. 
At night, though, it turns. It's a double-edged sword. At night, it uses oxygen and produces carbon dioxide. So at night, you'll notice the pH has a tendency to decline, and the oxygen levels have a tendency to decline in warm water, and that's when the waterfall cuts off because the power supply to the pump chokes out, and the waterfall stops, and without some sort of backup aeration system, like an air stone or another pump that is moving water, uh, the fish can die because there's no waterfall disrupting the surface. So some consideration might be given, and this is the case on every pond I've ever had since I had this happen to me, uh, where a pump kicked the breaker. Is I And uh, the guys that built that pond at my house will remember running two separate uh, poles of electricity off of the main box so that if one pump kicks the breaker, the other pump is still running, that they don't both kick the same breaker. If you have fish that are worth anything, it's worth doing that, two separate poles to the pond so that if one kicks the breaker, the other one keeps going. But uh, because if the waterfall dies, then your dissolved oxygen is going to crash out in warm water for sure. Okay. Um, the other thing about dissolved oxygen is it's hard to tell when the fish are gasping at the surface. You don't want to make the assumption that it's a dissolved oxygen problem. And, in fact, there are clues to say that it is or isn't. Let's say the fish are gasping at the surface. And you look at the pond, and the water's moving around pretty good. There's a little current under the water, and the waterfall's splashing around. Does that speak to a dissolved oxygen issue or gill damage? If you can see that there's probably a dissolved oxygen uh, saturation situation, if, if you can see there's got to be oxygen in the water because you've got a waterfall going, likely it's a gill problem parasites or water quality or something's compromising the ability of gills to transfer dissolved oxygen. But let's say that you go to a pond and there's not a lot of water movement and the waterfall is down to a trickle and the pond is kind of large so that there's not a lot of places for the fish to go to get more oxygen and they're around the waterfall pumping. It, that would be when you don't know for sure if it's a dissolved oxygen issue or gill damage. And so you're going to kind of really need to fix both things. You're going to want to do an exam on the gills and increase aeration water circulation. Get that waterfall moving. Get a couple air stones into that pond or put a pump, water pump on the bottom of the pond. It's a thing called fluming, and you can do it temporarily or you can do it permanently. And that is basically taking a water pump and putting it on the bottom of the pond aimed at the surface to create a swell of water and basically a ton of water moving to the surface of the pond where oxygen exchange can occur, and it works really, really well. I don't know why I call it fluming, because it creates a flume of water, so yay. Um, so that's that. And there's an article on koivet.com about fluming, but it's really about as simple as I just told you. Um, moving on from dissolved oxygen, let's talk about carbon dioxide very briefly as a, another water quality parameter of note. Um, Carbon dioxide has one behavior in water, and it's not to choke out fish because, interestingly, and I'll bet you didn't know this, oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels can exist independently in water. <gasps> yeah. Oxygen levels can be stupid high, and carbon dioxide levels can be stupid high. See, in the air you and I breathe, to have more of one of anything, you have to have less of the other. So, for example, air is a crap ton of nitrogen and then some oxygen and carbon dioxide and I guess one or two other things. But for there be, to be more oxygen, you have to have a little less of everything else. And for there to be more carbon dioxide, there has to be a little less of everything else. In water, that's not the case. In water, you can have a high carbon dioxide and a high oxygen. Or you can have low of both, or you know they can switch places or whatever. Uh, the behavior of carbon dioxide, though, is not necessarily to crowd out oxygen, but carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid just about every time it's produced. So every time the fish breathe, and all night long when they're, the plants are producing it, and in the decay processes, and uh, any time carbon dioxide is being produced, uh, the pH is being pulled down. It's a it's an issue with carbonic acid being produced. Um, and, you know, the pH would get pulled down completely, except that the um, carbonates in the system, 
carbonates in the system can be an issue to stop that from happening. That's a pH buffer. People drive like it's bumper cars. Like if they brush into you, it's like, oh, sorry, man. You know, uh, I don't get it. I think it's just too much TV. Um, back to what we were talking about. So carbon dioxide's behavior is to form carbonic acid, and that is naturally to drag down the pH. Sometimes segmentally during parts of the day when carbon dioxide is in excess, other times prevailingly, and you can prevent that carbon, carbon dioxide carbonic acid from being a problem with buffers that increase total alkalinity. Uh, so there's that. Uh, as far as water quality is concerned, there's other things to talk about as far as water clarity and the kinds of hazes that occur, um, bacterial hazes, algae hazes, um, dissolved sediment hazes, like right after a pond is set up and whether or not that stuff really matters, which sometimes it does. Uh, we can talk about the hazes a little bit in the seminar this weekend because I have some inf interesting information for you in particular on hazes, which is kind of what this seminar, uh, this online tutorial is supposed to be kind of preparing you for, is uh, more details on biofilm and then some discussion of, of the hazes and uh, the third, the 11th bacteria. Um, so um, these are subjects that we're all looking forward to. I'm looking forward to presenting because it's some really neat stuff. Uh, that'll make you fall in love all over again with ecosystem or aquascape ponds. Um, so then there's some other gases which we can talk about as far as water quality. But in general, when you have a pretty good grip on the nitrogen cycle, which is ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and the nitri nitrogen cycle as it feeds algae and the ways to kind of curb that using nature, and then the discussions of pH, and the way it is modified by carbon dioxide and carbonic acid, and then a brief discussion about dissolved oxygen, um, and being able to distinguish the difference between there not being enough oxygen or not being enough ability to use it because your gills are in trouble. That's a pretty thorough discussion of water quality in the time it takes for me to drive to work. Um, so. I think that's pretty much it as far as the water quality primer. I've left a ton out. Um, I'm going to do videos on my YouTube channel about hydrogen sulfide. It's not as big a problem as you would think. Uh, ten times the problem you would find in saltwater systems. Uh, almost a non sequitur in ecosystem ponds. Uh, most of the koi people have never seen a hydrogen sulfide system, and uh, the one that I will tell you about was extraordinary, uh, but that'll be in a different video. And um, I have a video that talks about uh, high levels of background pollution, how to measure uh, a one water quality parameter that relates to high levels of background pollution. It's called nitrate is your uh, hinge on that. Uh, there's a video on that. Um, so uh, very briefly, uh, I really do appreciate your attention, and I look forward to talking to you um, when we get together at the CAC meeting at Tom Smith's house uh, or Tom Smith's place. always look forward to those things, and I will talk to you soon.